can we Hi, and welcome. This is the 17th of our Connected Learning TV webinars that we conduct weekly. And today, we're going to be talking about uh, Mozilla WebMaker and as digital literacy through making and sharing. We have the, the privilege of having a great guest. We've got Mark Sermon, who's been a community activist and technology executive for more than 20 years. He's currently serving as the executive director at Mozilla, the, who we all know to be the makers of Firefox and one of the largest social enterprises in the world. At Mozilla, he is focused on using the open technology and ethos of the web to transform fields such as education, journalism, and filmmaking. You can follow him on Twitter at, um, at M. Sermon. And we have a number of uh, correspondents here who are going to be conversing. I will ask to introduce uh, yourselves in just a minute. And we also have people tuning in uh, through live stream and chatting there. And we are going to try to relay the chat uh, from the uh, from the live stream. Any kind of questions that arise, we're going to try to bring into the conversation here. And those of you in the live chat, we've got a, uh, a Google Doc to make notes on. And we invite all of you to to do that. So um, I think um, I think John is going to put the URL for that into the live stream chat. If not, I will do it in a minute. So let's get started with introductions, um, starting with Carla. Hi, everyone. I'm Carla Casilli. I work with Mozilla I, on the Open Badges Project. I'm the Open Badges Project lead, and I'm also very much focused on badge system design and <coughs> also um, WebMaker badges. So that's me. Oh, I'm next. Um, I'm Doug Belshaw. Um, I am Badges and Skills lead for Mozilla. And Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Dill, and I am representing. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Dill, and I'm representing uh, academic libraries here at, uh, in this great webinar. I have an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts in filmmaking, and in a week from Friday, I received my MLIS, which is a Master of Library and Information Sciences. And um, I'm focused on uh, digital literacy as well as online instruction and embedded librarianship. Congratulations, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. John? Hi there. I'm John Warona. I'm the Acting Chief Information Officer at the San Francisco Public Library and the Digital Initiatives Manager. Uh, we're in uh, the midst of a digital media learning lab uh, for teens, a planning process. And um, what I'm most interested in uh, uh, for the purposes of today is that we've been testing technology and testing our programmatic elements uh, with a series of pilot events. And uh, one of those uh, was a WebMaker event where we uh, utilized uh, the pre-alpha pre -alpha, uh, release of Thimble to uh, actually get uh, our neighbors, Twitter, uh, to come over and teach some teens uh, coding. And uh, it's, it's that kind of thing that um, we're testing to see if it would make a good fit for, for our, our learning lab program design. And uh, so far, it, it seems perfect. So let's get started. Mark, tell, tell us about what you're doing with, with WebMaker. Hi, how are you doing? And thanks for having me. Uh, and I will do just that. So let me do some screen sharing to, uh, to get us kicked off. All right, now it looks like you can see that window, right? So about six months ago, um, well, let me actually take you a little bit further back. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, Mozilla's really been looking at where does it need to go to continue to, to keep the web open, to, to look at our mission of keeping the web an open, dynamic, vibrant, resilient, place. And, and that was why we made Firefox in the first place, was really to, to make sure there was an alternative to Internet Explorer that advanced the idea that, that the web is something made up of, of standards, or less geekly than standards, really made up of 
a kind of core set of, of technical Lego blocks that anyone can use without asking permission from anybody else. And, and that, you know, that aspect of the internet, that aspect of the web, that it is just a set of Lego blocks that anyone can use, I think has been key to the creativity and the wealth and the, the wonder that the web has, has created in the last 15 years. And, you know, so, you know, over the last couple of years, we're looking at, well, what do we need to do beyond Firefox? Where are the needs? Where are the opportunities? Um, and, and we saw two big sort of threats to the web. One, uh, certainly that the, the mobile world and the tablet, tablet world don't work like the web. They're, um, you know, two proprietary operating systems for the most part in the world of smartphones. And the, the web is not the dominant platform on, on phones. And so Mozilla is doing a bunch of things, including a mobile operating system code named boot to gecko to make sure that that, that is, is something that we change. But the other thing we really saw was that people's understanding of how the web worked, the code behind the web, the mechanics of the web, even just how a, a URL might work, really was not very high uh, and was decreasing in a way that you know makes it easy for everything from uh, you know the gap between users and, and creators and app developers to widen to um, you know bad policies like SOPA or ACTA to, to go through because people just don't understand what the web is, and they certainly don't have full control over, over their online lives because they just don't have that literacy in kind of code and the mechanics of the web. Um, and so that's where Mozilla WebMaker came out of, is this, this feeling that we are in an era where it's just as important to understand the mechanics of the web, the mechanics of our digital world, the code behind it as it is to be able to read and write. That, that really code is a core literacy we all need to have at least a little bit of. Um, to express ourselves and, and have control of our lives. And so we launched Mozilla Webmaker, um, or we chose, decided to move ahead with Mozilla Webmaker really last December or January as Mozilla's third big initiative um, beyond Firefox and our mobile operating system and, and mobile plays. And what Webmaker is, uh, is a set of projects, tools, and, and a community of people who aim to, to help tens of millions of people, ideally eventually hundreds of millions of people, move from just using the web to being makers of the web. And in many ways, you know, uh, not all of us are, probably all of us on this call are, but uh, a majority of the web is to some degree on the front edge of that making. Um, you know, the, by my kind of estimates as I, as I kind of poke around online, it's around 1.2 billion people who are on social networks um, of, of the 2 billion people who are on the internet. So that's well over 50% of people on the internet who create some kind of content. And that's a very different world already than the world of television that I grew up in. It is a world where you know, people do make things and create content. But they do it in a way where they don't actually gain that much understanding of how the, the web works. And they certainly are limited um, in what they can do, what they can create, by whatever tools are, are offered by those social networking vendors. So Mozilla wants to do both. Um, we both want to raise people's understanding of how the web works on a massive, massive scale, but also give people uh, tools for expressing themselves, for creating things, for being makers on the web um, that are more open-ended uh, and aren't limited to clicking a box and filling in a form uh, as the, the sole form of creativity. And so to, to give that some meat, uh, you know, what we've done is um, we just launched WebMaker about three weeks ago, is create a set of tools um, that are basically creativity or self-expression tools, but that are closer to the code of the web uh, and also to teach you things. Uh, we've created a set of projects, which are basically starter projects. You can go in and, and make something very, very uh, quickly, um, but at the same time, learn a little bit about how the web works. And then we've started to create a community, um, uh, which has begun by asking people to just organize small, what we call, uh, code parties where you're teaching somebody else how to web works or how to code. And we've actually had about 650 of those either happen or registered for the summer in 80 countries around the world already. So WebMaker is really tools that, that ultimately compete with things like YouTube or, or Facebook as ways for people to express themselves, although we're not there yet. Uh, projects that teach you something and are kind of playful and then this community. And so let me just show you guys a bit about what those are. Um, you know, the, the first one, we, and we've had this one for a little bit of uh, time already, is something called the X-ray goggles. And it's really meant to show people 
that the web is made up of, of code and it's not that uh, you know it's not that hard to, to change it which I think people don't realize that they see a web just like a magazine web or a web page just like a magazine page and if you turn on the x-ray goggles which are just a bookmarklet and I'll turn them on here uh, let's see if it, they then let me go over different parts of the page and see are you guys seeing that yes and you're seeing basically what the HTML is under any individual element of the of the page and for many people that's just a huge aha to say oh wow I didn't realize that you know there was a little code in there that just looks like something that's printed out um, but the, the real thing we want people to, to learn and you know you learn this in really three or four minutes of playing with this tool is everything on the web is malleable everything on the web is is remixable so if I go over this um, this H3 tag, this text that says make something amazing <coughs> on the web, and I hit R for remix, uh, I will hopefully on my slow computer go in and I'll see you know, what that text was, and then I can actually just go in there and type over it. I'll say connected learning is awesome, and so are you. And then I can go commit changes, and then all of a sudden that web page says connected learning is awesome, and so are you. And you know, for probably everybody on this page or sort of on this call, that's not that revolutionary thing to see. But for so many of the people who just use the web every day and think that it is just something being printed out, understand they can change it. Doing that kind of change on say on on you know the Google homepage or on Facebook is incredibly enlightening and empowering. And that's the kind of insight that we hope that the webmaker program and the tools and projects we produce um, will help people have. Uh, and in more and more advanced ways. So the other two tools are something called Mozilla uh, Mozilla Thimble, uh, and Mozilla Thimble is basically a very simple code editor, but it comes with projects that teach you a, a bunch about uh, about how HTML and CSS work. And so here's a project inside of Thimble uh, that gets me going. Um, by uh, that was made by the the London Zoo. And if I'm a kid who's interested in learning about animals, they can co come and learn about these animals, and also learn a bit about HTML and CSS. So if I go and I make a project on large awesome animals and open this up, uh, it's going to load me into what, for anybody who edits modern HTML, you'll just see as one of these kind of standard code editors you see, it's two panes. If I type in it, um, you know, you'll see right away that the, the code changes uh, immediately on the right side. Um, but what's interesting is this is all uh, oriented towards, you know, having comments in there that walk you through an instructional lesson about HTML. So this is teaching you a bunch about basic HTML, including how to manipulate images. And in this case, if I scroll down the right pane, I can also learn about the blue whale, which is an endangered species, the black rhinoceros, the Asian elephant. And the th each of those pictures is actually a sliced set of graphics, a sliced set of images that is teed up to help me remix my own animal. And so if I go in here and I go say, okay, well there's, um, and if I were reading slowly I would see this, there is the first piece hold on, of the blue whale. I can go and take that image and put it up top under the unknown animal piece. I'll paste that there, and then I'll go down to one of the other animals, the elephant. And I'll take that graphic. So now I'm learning about URLs and uh, learning that a file and a URL, or an image file and a URL, are actually the same thing. Which in the world where people don't know about URLs is actually an important lesson to teach. So I now put those in there. Now if I go actually back up to that empty picture frame, I've started to build an animal that's part whale, part elephant and so on. So that's what Thimble does and if you actually go into our projects gallery um, there's a lot of different Thimble projects that let you do all kinds of things like a game where you save a bunny and a, a thing where you kill zombies and so on. And the point of Thimble is to be a, a place where you just come and make something cool. Maybe you make a, a lull cat or a funny meme or whatever but you quickly learn about HTML uh, at the same time. And then the last tool in this mix is something called Popcorn, uh, which is really a, a video editor that teaches you about APIs and mashups and re remixing and all that kind of stuff. 
And it comes with some templates here where you can make a simple newscast, which is something that you might want to do. And you can very quickly produce that. Uh, or where you can make a funny robot invasion video where using Google Maps, the robot invades your own town. Uh, or in this case, I'll, I'll open this up now. I can make up a, a kind of pop-up video like they do on the music video channels, um, putting my own comments over top of um, the video that's going on. So hopefully this will load faster than it is. Maybe, oh, I've got it in another, t in another tab. Um, so here I can actually you can see when I go over that green box that pop comes on top. Um, and I could just keep adding more and more pops. I guess if I kept playing, I, I would. And what that does is what, what you end up getting people doing with this pop-up video template is they add their own video in and they start actually kind of just making commentary over top of, on top of it, which is teaching a bunch of stuff both about media literacy uh, and just about sort of how you layer stuff on top of video using the web. Other the templates in here teach more advanced things about manipulating video, pulling in data from APIs, uh, and so on. And so that, uh, that's a tour of some of the first things we've launched uh, with WebMaker. And I just want to go to this um, piece. Um, and as you can see from the project gallery that we looked at before and from all those examples, even though we're in a really embryonic state, um, the idea is clear and consistent that we want to get people not into looking at a chalk chalkboard and looking at um, you know, how to learn code in the abstract, but we want to get people in making something absolutely quickly and, and right away. And, um, and then through that, we want to kind of up-level their skills. And over time, we hope that those creativity tools and, and the skills that they're going to get will evolve into a world that we're not all just filling in social media forms, but we're all able to program our own apps or hack our own games or uh, create things that are more advanced than what we can create today on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and as we do that, that the mainstream of, of really uh, all of, all, you know, everybody who uses the internet is a, a group of people who can not only read the web, but also know how to write the web. Um, but we're just at the very beginning of that uh, and certainly are looking to build a big tent of, of people who want to do that same thing because we're not going to be able to build all the tools or teach all the people uh, and, and so on. And I guess actually the very last thing I would say after that uh, poetic ending is we do really want to get people out there at the grassroots playing with this stuff and teaching. And so that's the point behind this summer code party and all these kitchen table events uh, that are happening around the world is we do think that this is, is something that uh, people can do and want to do and should do one-on-one -on -one with each other. So there you go. That's the end of, of the opening, Howard, and, and everybody else. Thanks for letting me ramble on. Thanks. Great, great illustrations. Uh, who wants to jump in here? Well, I'd like to ask a question. Um, we, I'm very familiar with maker spaces and, and projects like these being associated with public libraries. And I'd like to know how one would implement this in an academic library environment and perhaps how you would justify it or get funding for things of this nature. Um, I don't know how you would justify or get funding. You're the academic librarian. So I don't know how academic librarians justify and get, get things funded. But I, I certainly can, can very easily think of the, the use cases for it, um, you know, which is we're talking about, about things that both uh, people can use to organize and express information, um, but also, um, you know, the kind of up their, up their skills in doing that. And so when things are a little bit more advanced, one could imagine, um, well, even now, one could imagine building some of those um, pre-baked thimble templates uh, or even some of those popcorn templates around particular things that you would want people to be uh, doing in the library. And so, for example, uh, people have played a lot with that same format as the newscaster template in, um, in popcorn as a template for doing book reports. And so the idea of kind of having, you know, some supportive environment where people can kind of come out and learn how to do really quick video book reports or, or video equivalents to a small project essay or whatnot, 
you know, would be a, a thing that you could throw into a, an academic context like that. And, you know, I'm sure we can imagine a dozen different examples. And actually, may, maybe I do have an answer on the justification and the funding, or at least an idea, which is the, the very, specific, very intentional design choice that we've made is to have these, um, these tools as a fairly open-ended system that people who have their own particular uses, so the London Zoo, they're coming and they really want to teach about conservation, they want to target 8 to 14 year olds, they can come and build a little project very easily inside of that frame and we can promote it and, and we can give them the scaffolding, but it's very specifically targeting like their audience and their learning objectives as well as teaching HTML and, and visual literacy as a part of it. You know, you could imagine like what is your academic library, what do university libraries in general want people to be using this kind of technology for, and then going out and getting funding around just building those those projects out, uh, which is not a complex thing to do. I mean, you just need an idea of what you want to teach, and some people who know some HTML and can do some graphics. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Who else wants to jump in here? Um, yeah, I will. So it, it's Doug. Um, so what Mark was saying there at the end, um, just in terms of from a kind of information literacy, media literacy, web literacy point of view. Um, so <clears throat> there's an organization called Sconnell, which did the seven pillars of information literacy, which we'll be very aware of, Elizabeth. Um, and recently they've been doing some work around digital literacy and putting kind of a lens upon that information literacy. And a really important part of that digital literacy is being able to understand the web in terms of the information side of it, but also being able to write it in a very kind of real way. And some of these tools that are being um, used by Mozilla, available for free, um, address that need um, and, and also can be provided in a library setting where you've got a lot of computers, where you've got librarians who have got the skills to guide people. So it's a really nice marriage of um, theory and, and, and very kind of useful, free, um, high-level kind of practice. I think it's, it's a really nice um, juxtaposition. Well, I'm particularly uh, specialized in online librarianship with the development of MOOCs and, and all of the online education that, that we're offering and others are offering. Um, do you have any ideas uh, for incorporating that within a, a strictly online environment? Yeah, well, I mean, I think especially that, I don't know if, if that Doug has an answer as well, but I think especially the popcorn example around doing video-based reporting lends itself to that kind of online uh, piece and reporting back your research or, or the work you're doing through those kind of video-based reports that then can layer on data, layer on, um, you know, illustrative visuals and that kind of stuff very, very easily. Like, we could imagine that. We're just as simply uh, as we're here in this hangout, recording my little report, and then quickly layering on those visuals and supporting pieces in, in something like popcorn, and then sharing them back in that online environment with my peers or, or other students. And I, I think that's interesting on a bunch of levels. It's interesting partly because you're going to learn about what's possible with those online media, and you're going to get the digital literacy outcomes that we all want. But uh, also, I you know, I think that there's a very interesting thing to um, to look at how you innovate and, and change how people communicate in, in just a, a, I mean, I'm assuming you're talking about online, with, including with undergraduates and stuff, you know, how do you innovate what the essay or the report is in a way that feels native to a YouTube generation? Um, and, I, and I think that's not just about effective learning uh, in the abstract, it's about effective learning tied to, like, uh, the culture of, of people who are in university today. Um, and I'd like to add to that. I think that what Mark was talking about also that there being uh, an opportunity for um, offline interaction for people to teach one another face to face. I think we also have to ask ourselves when we're talking about MOOCs, if we're also talking about like what are the affordances that are available to people in these online courses and then how can they be 
adapted outward or how can they be used or exploited in ways that are specific to that environment but also recognize that there's always a need for um, some kind of face-to-face -face interaction whether or not that is a video that gets broadcast or whether or not there are synchronous communications and I, I think what we're what the tool the webmaker tool is is essentially that it's a it's a large tool that allows people to have different possibilities for interaction you can use it one-on-one -on -one and you can also use it in kind of a um, here's something we'd like you to accomplish. Now go ahead and accomplish that and then we can come back and, and chat about it. Absolutely. And and what Carla mentioned there about MOOCs. Um, so someone I know who works in Ireland and she works um, just like you do, Elizabeth, in terms of working online all the time with, with students. Um, and what she finds is that there, there's a, and I used to be a teacher as well, so I, I kind of get this in terms of there's a lot of people who have grown up within a walled garden of, for example, Facebook. Um, and can use tools which are provided, which don't allow you to remix stuff and do things and, and change um, things in, in a kind of a web native way. So when they see tools like um, X-ray goggles, when they see, for example, Thimble and Popcorn, all that kind of stuff, it, it is what Mark said before in terms of being revolutionary. It's a mind shift. It's a time when they realize that actually this is how the web works. Um, and actually I can have an impact on it. And it's especially important in, in, in that kind of either blended learning or distance learning environment because all of your interaction or part of your interaction at least is being mediated by the computer. And if you don't have that kind of, or the, and the web as well. So if you don't have that kind of understanding, then you feel slightly disempowered. Um, so it's a hugely empowering set of tools I would suggest. Quick, quick uh, note of information for those who are watching who have not heard of MOOCs yet. MOOC stands for M O O C, Massive Open Online Course. And and while I have the microphone, I do have a question uh, that that's kind of related here from the the, the live stream. Beyond uh, making these web making tools available. Um, are, are there programs that train and support teachers in K through 12 schools with using these tools? The answer is not yet. Uh, certainly the, the intention is that they're, you know, whether it's academic libraries or public libraries, I'd, I'd love to hear from John and, and talk about public libraries a little bit, uh, or, uh, or schools, that there's a lot of environments that this stuff can and should work in. Um, we, you know, given that we're only six months from making the decision and, and three weeks into having launched this stuff, we haven't gotten to, to anything close to all the places we want to get to. And our first priority um, was really to kind of get into the informal education space. And so whether that's people teaching around their kitchen table or people using it in libraries, um, we thought we could learn a lot faster that way. But it's certainly uh, in the plans to, to look at teachers and, and really Many of them have just kind of shown up on their own to, to come and play with the stuff and learn about it. But we want to do that more systematically, uh, you know, over the, the coming, uh, you know, 6, 12, 18 months. And I guess we're really looking for people who have ideas on, on how we can do that practically and in an agile way that, that gets some momentum quickly. So I'll jump in here. Um, you know, the library is always has always been uh, the facilitator, sort of, um, uh, a place for independent learning um, and a good platform for this type of thing. And you know, when I hear the question about, um, you know, how do we uh, get funding, um, or do, you know, do d does there need to be a lot of training uh, here? I, I think what's beautiful about it is, you know, neither are really um, huge requirements of of tools like this. You know, it it is it is pretty um, it it is pretty uh, low overhead uh, in terms of. Um, the investment to, to get up and running um, with technology uh, or the sort of ability to teach it. Um, you know, and that the library knew when we embarked on this learning lab, you know, planning process that we weren't going to be able to, uh, librarians weren't going to be able to, you know, open the doors and, and teach uh, how to do video editing. So we partnered with the Bay Area Video Coalition to bring that programmatic element. And we knew that we weren't going to be able to, you know, open up the lab and be able to teach coding. And you know, right on time, something like this uh, shows up that really allows you know for folks who don't necessarily have that skill set to connect the people who who want to learn to the tools that allow them to do really self-directed learning and sort of um, the peer the peer supported learning. You know, when I saw this in a room, you know, we had some facilitators, um, but really 
you'd get three kids together at one computer, even though there were plenty enough to go around for individuals, they would group together and kind of help each other through it. You know, because it's it's in plain English and um, it it is really accessible. So I think it's you know that we're we're going for digital media literacy, um, but we're also trying to get there with a self-directed approach. And and I think that it's tools like this that allow that to happen more than the sort of top-down. Um, teaching model that's you know been the norm for so long, but that is also still pretty inherent in university uh, academic libraries, unfortunately. True. Did, so Doug, did you want to have say something about badges? Can I just say something about libraries first before we get to to badges? Go just for that, it. You know, it, it just to, I mean, I guess with all of this, like I said about the teachers, we're really looking for. Um, you know, kind of help reaching out to these different constituencies and making this something that, that they can run with and, and supporting them. And we've actually seen some really good early responses from the public library community. I mean, we're certainly working with John and, and Bayback and, and people here in San Francisco around that kind of stuff. But we've actually had um, some good early contact with the, it's, it's called YALSA, the Young Association of Library. Do you know what YALSA stands for, John? Um, but it's the Association of Young Librarians. And uh, and they they did a hack jam jam at their event where they kind of played with some of the stuff and have started to push that out through their uh, their network. And in fact, the New York Public Library, as a result of that, did one of those projects, the Make Your Own Vintage Three D Web Page, uh, in that project gallery. And um, I can actually type that into the chat if people are interested. And I guess why why I wanted to say that, other than just to to add build on what John said about librarians, is I think there's a huge um, constituency people out there who have that tradition of that, um, you know, top, that bottom-up teaching and who, but work in institutions that feel fairly top-down. And so whether that's individual teachers who really believe in kind of hands-on maker learning, or whether that's librarians who have a passion for kind of bottom-up peer learning discovery, or whether that's artists uh, who really love the, you know, get joy out of watching people learn how to create. I think there's there's huge uh, constituencies out there for whom this idea of like making and creativity as a way to learn about the technology of the web is really going to resonate. Um, and I both want to throw that out as our, our goal to work with all those folks and, and, and see there really is a kind of affinity there, but also to as a call for, for kind of help and participation. Because if you feel, if, if that sounds like it describes you, you believe in kind of making and learning creativity. Um, you know, this is a place that, that we really want to welcome you and get you involved. And librarians are the vanguard of that. So, Doug, badges. Well, I'm sure Carlo will want to jump in here, but um, badges are obviously the answer to everything. Um, we've done a whole, <laughs> we've done a whole um, webinar about this, so people need to go back and have a look at whatever number it is. I'm sure John can look up what number it is, but basically um, we've done a whole thing about it. But badges is a, a, a way of um, signaling and um, accrediting informal learning. Um, and I'm working on kind of web literacy stuff for Mozilla, and that's going to kind of be badged eventually. And I think that feeds into a number of things, um, because there's some questions in the Google Doc, for example, and, and sorry, Howard, if you don't want to go off on this tangent. Um, do stop me. But there's one of the questions in, in the Google Doc, which I think is really interesting, and something which comes up time and time again. Anytime you bring in something which reconfigures or changes or, um, something which has been standard and, and seen as the thing to do in formal education. So, for example, the question in the, in the Google Doc is about how we can use WebMaker tools to improve scores on state-administered testing. <laughs> So that's great, and, and that's a really naughty and thorny issue, but there's, there's two things here. First of all, there's doing X to get Y, which sometimes can happen, but sometimes there's kind of rejecting that idea in terms of the state administrators testing be, being the, the be-all and end-all to what we're trying to do in education. There's a, there's a very important element of human flourishing here. Um, which I think that open badges and the web literacy stuff and the web maker stuff um, starts to address. 
So maybe this kind of thing needs to happen um, outside of school to start off with, at after school club. Maybe it's going to be used by forward thinking educators in the classroom. But I don't think you can necessarily map it on to existing high stakes testing because sometimes those two things are intention. What does everyone well, else think? The one thing I would, would say about that, I think it's not just high stakes testing, it's, it's the thing that's tied to that is also just a very narrow or, or specific set of what the important disciplines are, like what's an elective and what's uh, you know what's core curriculum, and especially here in the U.S. I mean, there's just an obsession not just with the testing, but with the the Common Core. And but I think a, a middle place to make some headway is there's a tremendous amount of discussion both in the U.K. and the U.S. about uh, how to to kind of replace the ICT electives with computer science electives. And um, you know, in the U.S., there's a, an effort by the National Science Foundation to build out. 10,000 new secondary school teachers teaching computer science. And what's interesting is none of that or most of that does not really include the web either as a technology or as a kind of way of organizing and, and collaborating. It really is almost like I don't, it's, it's, I mean it, it's an approach to teaching it that I've seen that could have been done a, a decade or two ago in terms of how it thinks about the concepts you need to learn. So I, I think Doug you're right about informal for the reasons you say and, and not being in the high stakes testing environment but I think the computer science discussion in the in at least those two countries is an entry point into the, the formal education discussion um, that, that is open for us to see. Yeah I think part of that Mark is because um, people take the web for granted and you must I mean we've all seen this um, and the conflation of without wanting to you know you don't want to get too geeky about it but the conflation of the internet, the infrastructure, and, and the web, the kind of layer that sits on top of it. And that invisible layer of the web um, is being commoditized and you know that's a whole discussion. But you know, it's it's kind of making it's making people see the stuff that they take for granted, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I think the opportunity um, for badges actually stems for a variety of different reasons, and it actually goes hand in hand with the web maker initiative which is essentially let's rethink, let's not get locked into traditional status quo or standards where people are coming from. And um, and if we do approach it from an informal standpoint, that's where we actually have the, the biggest pathway in. So why not um, make use of that as much as possible and see how far we can get. And then if there are ways that then that feeds into the traditional formal academic environment or the traditional academic environments, fantastic. But let's make sure that people are, all of that is getting captured somewhere and it's happening somewhere. Are you are you uh, contemplating doing any MOOCs around uh, web making, Mark? Uh, we have contemplated. We have not planned. Um, and I, you know, I guess the thing we still haven't seen. I mean, I, I think lots of people would be happy for us to do it, and and we probably should jump in and experiment with that at, at some point. Um, but you know, the thing I've seen with most of the MOOCs, and I don't know, Howard, you watched the space, so whether you agree. Um, is they tend not to be as oriented towards the making and they tend to be very lecture oriented and traditionally kind of assignment oriented. Um, and I guess we could go and do it differently, but I, I think we don't know how to do that yet. Um, you know, how, how you have the more hands-on constructive as MOOC. Have you uh, seen the uh, George Seaman, Stephen Downs, uh, Dave Cormier uh, version of MOOCs? Because no. what's been getting all of the publicity are the 100,000 uh, right. students, uh, Stanford professor, um, that kind of fits that broadcast model you were discussing. But before they were doing that, um, George and Stephen and, and Dave were doing things with about 1,000 or 2,000 people at a time. But they had, I think, what would, would work well with Mozilla, which was a distributed model in which they had a, a, a daily compilation and they asked people to self-organize their their discussion groups so people had blogs and then they had a an aggre an RSS aggregator so that people could read each other's blogs and comment on each other's blogs so there's a lot of self-organized uh, discussion and work that went along with the kind of standard lecture webinar and I think that you know some kind of combination of what they they do with uh, the the um, 
Udacity kind of MOOCs where they've got little assignments and, and little tests and, and Code Academy does that really uh, nicely but also with real people having real discussions and real learning groups with each other I think it uh, might be worthwhile just my two, two cents uh, on yeah, that. Right. I think it's definitely on the radar of, of stuff to dig into and I don't know whether or not like Looking up with those connectivist ones directly is the right thing, or just to do our own. But it, that sounds more promising. I would just like to jump in uh, about badges on the idea that um, well, if you guys all have any thoughts, I've, I've talked with Mark a little bit about this, but just how badges, while they will recognize accomplishments, and and that seems like sort of um, you know the the, the obvious goal. What I'm really interested in and hopeful for is that when these badges appear in different locations on the web um, and they they are the same badges in different areas or when a badge can be recognized out of its context, its original context, you know, how does that really serve connected learning, connecting the different learning environments? Um, you know, we're struggling with an idea here about how to connect all these different organizations in you know these these digital media and other types of um, educational, whether it's informal or formal educational organizations in the city, and we want to connect. You know, even on a nationwide level, and we want people to sort of feel like, hey, I, I did some web making over here. I want to go do some, you know, geek out on video production, and I want to sort of jump to another level or to another, you know, track. And I'm wondering if you guys see the potential for badges to really connect various disciplines with a sort of validation process, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, go ahead, Carla. I was going to say, absolutely, that's actually a conversation that Doug and I were just having on another call, um, which is how can we make sure that um, badges are kind of entry points and that people can find, then they can find pathways through them, so that it's not necessarily linear, but it's instead there's this wide universe and you can jump around and you don't necessarily need to be entirely, you don't need to reach uh, what might be considered mastery level in order to be functional within that environment. And, and a lot of times functionality, um, you know, the satisficing level is going to be more than effective. And I think some, that gets back to some of the questions or comments earlier, which is when you start to implement a standard or you start to implement kind of a global universal, um, and this is what's happened within traditional academic environment, um, when you start to introduce that standard, that's when things start to go haywire because you have all of these people who are at different levels who actually have different interests, um, but now they're being held to a certain level that that may not may or may not be functional for them. And so badges can actually offer the opportunity to start thinking way beyond that. So if you can start badging at different levels, you can start having um, not necessarily uh, things that are at course level, but they can be at a more granular level, they can be at a higher level, so that people can start to move in between and it's not just a linear or or even a two-dimensional concept, but actually starts to move into that a third dimension. Here, here. I'll see if there's some questions from the uh, live stream. Can you see oh, I did that, not have just sorry, go on. Yeah. I was just going to say, while you're doing that, and Mark and I are trying to talk at the same time. Oh, you're <laughs> muted, Howard. You're muted. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, so, so here's a question uh, from the live stream. Uh, shouldn't badges be connected to products that reflect the value of the, of the badge? And then there was a question, um, what products do you mean? And the answer to that was, uh, Code Academy should have us make things. So uh, you know, I I see that that the, the web making projects that Mark has has shown us show people how to play with things and and kind of make things, but it's sort of like the remix stuff is it, it's sort of like a toy. It's not something that you're you're actually finished with that you go ahead and use. Um, well, I, I would say I would say a couple things about that. Um, you know, both about what you said, Howard, and what was in the in the chat. Um, Absolutely, in my opinion, we should be connecting badges to, to the products themselves, both to products meaning things you software you use, uh, and products meaning outputs, you know, things you put in your portfolio or things you've made. Uh, and that's our intention. I mean, it's not there in those first 
versions we've released in the last three weeks, but all of that thimble and popcorn stuff will have badges built into it by the end of the year um, that both have that, um, you know, recognizing what you've learned and achieved and how you've helped others out inside of that and the, the portfolio element. But I, I would actually argue, and this is pretty key to where we want to go, that while the Remix stuff that's there right now uh, is a bit toy-like, that Remix itself and starting from um, other people's work is not. Um, and in fact, that the broad majority of things that get made on the web today, um, and really this has been the case for at least a decade, if, if not almost always, uh, are built on Remix. I mean, that's been the, the view source ethos of the, of the web and then the open source building blocks of open source code libraries or web servers or content management systems or, or whatnot really is about taking other people's work and recombining it to express a new idea or to make a thing you need to get done. So the, you know, it looks toy like right now because we're just at the beginning, but our hope is that there really is a, a GitHub-like uh, repository behind all these tools that we have. So if I make something real, like probably the closest thing is that newscaster video, um, you know, if I actually have a good template for making a newscaster video, uh, and then somebody else did another one that's in Arabic, or somebody else did another one that is on a theme that I'm in, you can imagine those being in a repository and under a license, where I just pull those back up and, and make my own. Um, so I, I, we actually do believe that build, the remix is central to the making process, and, and that that should be a core part of the design. Has Mozilla done any uh, uh, partnership with museums or contemplating any partnerships with, with museums? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the Hive Learning Network that, that we uh, operate and, and, you know, help all of the members within New York is, is very much, um, you know, got a set of museums that, that work as a part of that. And so that's a network of people who take connected learning principles, the idea of uh, peer, you know, peer-based learning and uh, interest-based learning and you know, based on a good academic base and, and really with a big maker spirit to it. We're looking at how you take those connected learning principles into existing informal education programs and institutions and, and drive new kinds of learning experiences around those principles. Uh, so that's what Hive is about. What it means is people like the American Museum of Natural History or the MoMA or the New York Hall of Science and, and so on, along with libraries as, lo as, as well as you know, youth all kinds of different youth organizations uh, are, are getting together to do science curriculum in Central Park that is about collecting and digitalizing, visualizing data or things where kind of the kind of learning we're talking about here become a part of, of all kinds of interest-based learning. Um, so we do that a lot and, and we're starting to look at doing that in other cities including in, here in San Francisco with the, the consortium of groups that uh, John talked about earlier. And, you know, I think what's, what's interesting about the work we've done with museums so far is there's a thirst, uh, and I think you see this in libraries too, to take the deep and important purpose of museums or the deep and important purpose of libraries, uh, you know, which is access to knowledge, the ability to discover the, you know, kind of wonder uh, that it is in all of us and look at how you... Uh, you know, how you pursue that, how you amplify that, how you offer that to people uh, in the era of the web. And, and I think there's a really juicy thing with museums and libraries around, you know, the, the things that, the purpose that they've had for centuries uh, being manifested in the web. And that's an exciting place to, to play with all this stuff. Carla, did you want to talk about web making badges? Uh, sure. So, so we're a little bit early on in that um, we're essentially taking the work that we've done with the open badge infrastructure, and there are actually a number of organizations when we were asking about um, are we partnering with any museums. Um, there are actually a number of museums who are very interested in issuing badges. Um, and just to put that out there. Um, but then also from the webmaker badges, we're, we're looking at the work that we've done internally. And um, now that we've asked a whole bunch of organizations to think about what are the things that go into a badge system, um, what is the technical, what are the technical ways that you can plug into our system, we're doing the exact same thing. So we're building from all of the initiatives that are ongoing with um, Thimble and with 
uh, popcorn and we're trying to see what are the ways that we can produce badges that actually make sense and then ultimately creates that kind of universe that I talked about a little earlier. So right now we're starting pretty small and then we're seeing where are the areas that we'd like to progress to and then ultimately, you know, two or three years down the road, what are the kind of badges that we think Mozilla will be offering or will we be endorsing other badge systems? So the concept of web making is really the concept of building a community and that community can be leveraged out in a variety of ways and um, well, we can offer badges from the web maker standpoint, there can also be kind of reciprocity between a recognition of that um, other organizations doing similar things can produce the same kind of relevance or knowledge. So um, from the web maker standpoint, we are off and running. Um, the one thing that I wanted to mention too that we haven't talked about so far is the idea that a lot of this is driven by the fact that we are open source and everything that we've done so far, the open badge initiative is open source, Thimble is open source, all of these things actually lead to the idea that um, the concept of web making is also the concept of sharing. And, um, and people can take all of the content that we're working on and hopefully scaffold off of it or build from it or build back into it. So um, who knows, maybe ultimately we'll be offering some kind of web making badges like you've significantly altered the web making offering, now you get a badge for that. So it can become extremely high level. Um, but right now we're focused on what are, the, what, what are the small projects that we can see recognition for and get people moving along a pathway. And I'm sure Doug will have something to say about that too. I was just going to say that I absolutely agree with the community aspect, and I, I realize we haven't, I don't think, mentioned the email list. I don't know if Mark was going to mention that at the end, but oh, I put the okay. link into the Google Doc if people are interested, and you can sign up there. And there's already lively discussions going on all, all around the world. Yeah. Do you have any uh, new tools on tap or, or, or planning, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I can I can say a little bit of uh, about what's in the the pipeline and the the dream line, which are a little bit different uh, than each other. So, so the the plan for the rest of the year is really to um, further build out um, further build out Thimble and further build out Popcorn. And the primary primary things we're going to do there are add badges uh, and add a bunch of more advanced capabilities, and in particular, add the ability for um, kind of publishing galleries and sharing and social so people can work on these things together and also people can can build these things that others can take and fork and, and remix. Um, so that that's what I think you'll see as well as just a huge growth or, or push on the community and the reach we're trying to do in terms of working with different partners in different places. That's what you can expect to see in the next six months or five months. Uh, the things that are sort of more and what I think of is the, the dream line than the pipeline which is uh, moving into more advanced programming, which, um, you know, a bunch of visions are kind of kicking around. One is to really move into hackable HTML5 games next year, so where we would look at um, having games that are designed for playability, that are designed to be popular, but, um, but they also have a, a level editor that is based on HTML and CSS and JavaScript built into the game. Uh, so if you wanted to modify it and share your modification with your friends, that would be an easy thing to do. Um, so if you can imagine going on to Facebook uh, and uh, you know taking your your teacher's um, avatar picture and then wrapping it around a sphere in WebGL and putting it in the Angry Birds slingshot, um, you can imagine that you know that kind of capability would be popular with people. Um, and so you know that's one tool which I think we'll see something along those lines of kind of games and learning. Uh, how to code next year, if I get my way, uh, and then you know another is really to look at mobile. Um, we're releasing this uh, um, you know code named Boot to Gecko mobile operating system, and probably be called uh, I think Firefox OS actually on phones, uh, which is really just HTML5. Um, and so how do you build? It's a big question. How do you build a kind of a creativity suite or, or web making tools that actually work for the next billion people who get online and will never see a, a desktop or laptop computer. Um, so I think that's another thing which is in the play with in 2013 uh, list. You're muted, Howard. Thank you. Uh, you notice that quickly. So we got uh, just uh, just a, a, a few more minutes here and, and I've got one more question. How can librarians possibly mentor people into communities of practice that value hacking and making? 
Sorry, say the beginning. How can who mentor? And, and maybe Elizabeth has has something to say about that. Uh, librarians. Okay. Okay. You want to go first, Elizabeth? Elizabeth's muted. No, I was muted. Now, um, well, at Valdosta State University, we have started a, a maker space here at at our university. Um, we don't know that there is, is another one that's affiliated in higher education. We just have a very bare bones setup, and we are looking to expand and to be able. We don't even have a 3D printer yet, so we are at the very beginning stages of trying to have um, a very uh, connected learning environment and and have all sorts of of people, academics throughout our campus, to be able to congregate and build and and hack and, and do all of those things. We're, we're, we're starting, we're trying. So I'll just say, you know, the only thing you can't hack at the library is the actual pages of actual books. You know, if we see an X-Acto knife, that's off limits. But beyond that, we absolutely um, encourage, you know, the, the reuse, um, the, the use and then reuse of um, information. You know, I think that's always been our ideal. Um, we don't censor, uh, you know, the ability to, to view content or, or to make content. Um, it's sort of a, you know, a free zone. But I think we have a responsibility to also teach a little bit about, you know, um, uh, intellectual property. And, um, you know, we should talk a little bit about Creative Commons. And we should talk about, you know, licensing your stuff so that it can be used again. And, you know, give people a little bit of context around hacking and around, um, you know, using uh, and and um, and reusing and uh, sort of remaking the things that they consume, um, but they should absolutely know that, um, as Mark was saying, you know that's been, you know, even before uh, uh, the web and digital making, where it was easy to copy and paste, you know, great artists steal. They've done it for for generations. It's it's how it's how you start. You know, the um, the masters would go and copy their idols in the museum. You know, it's it's just it's just how how you get started. You know, you trace um, uh, in order to to kind of learn the lines. And so, you know, I think um, uh, librarians have always sort of uh, understood that. Um, and I think in the academic environment, you know, I, I've worked in um, uh, a couple of different um, colleges and universities, and you know, I, I think it's always uh, sort of a good point, and uh, I, I think we support that in libraries. I might also piggyback on what you're saying um, to add about privacy. Um, one thing that I've been exploring uh, within my thesis is uh, implementing social media and online library instruction. And there are all sorts of implications, privacy implications, and even FERPA implications of the privacy of, of education and information of that. So I think that's another area that librarians um, are very important as educators. We have time for another comment. If there's something that you really want to get in, now's the time to, to do it. I was just going to mention, Howard, um, about the... I used to work for an organization called JISC in the UK who kind of fund work in various areas. And one of the ways in which they've been funding work is around um, kind of the idea of mobile libraries, not in the sense of putting lots of books in vans and going around villages, but in the sense of um, mobile devices in the library. So there's things you can do, for example, um, to, to kind of make people aware that these books are important, but they're not sacred objects that, you know, can't be changed in any way. Um, you can do things like put QR codes on them. You can um, do some kind of augmented reality stuff around them. Um, you can scan them in and then do stuff with them. There's lots of different things you can do with books which have kind of a hacker ethos behind them without without making them seem completely separate from the digital world in which we reside. Great. Hacking digital books. So we're uh, at the end of the hour here. And thank you, Mark. This has really been rich. And Carla, Doug, Elizabeth, and John, thank you so much for a rich uh, conversation. This is, will all be archived along with the, the, the group notes at connectedlearning.tv. And in fact, there will be a comment thread uh, there for uh, people who want to discuss this further. So do do check in on that in a, in a little while. We're going to have a, another session. Our next session will be Tuesday, 
July 24th at 10 a.m. Pacific time with Brazilian professor Raquel Requero on the topic of digital youth, social movements, and democracy in Brazil. So thank you all. And I'm sure I will see you all again online or in person. All right. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, Howard. Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone.